David Hoskins had one passion as a young boy. He wanted to be like James Bond. James Bond had the respect of everybody. You know, uh, he drove the latest sports cars, he traveled to exotic places, and he was surrounded by beautiful women. And in my heart, that's who I wanted to be. But the reality was David was awkward and didn't have many friends. I was really poor at sports. I just had a terrible self-image. And so when you grow up with that, you start, you start looking for ways to get attention. You start looking at what's going to bring me value. You know, how do I get attention from people? As the son of an evangelist, David grew up going to church. But his dad was often away because of his ministry obligations. I didn't get a lot of time with my dad. These are the people that should love me the most. And if they're not giving their, me their most valuable asset, which is their time, you know, what's wrong with me? So he looked for other ways to get the attention he craved. What I quickly discovered, making money was better than sports and better being good at school because that got you immediate recognition and respect anywhere. The only reason I wanted money, because I wanted women. And I realized that in order to have the women, I needed the money. But he needed a plan. So when the Berlin Wall fell in 1989, David saw a business opportunity. He turned to his father for help. We'd seen TV of, of what was happening in the former Soviet Union with lines of people standing up for, you know, waiting in line for, for basic needs. So my dad gave me 500 bucks in his credit card. We bought a ticket, and I went to Russia. David discovered he had a knack for business. He started a printing company and then expanded into other areas. I started contracting with big U.S. companies that knew that the future of business was in Russia, so we'd bring in all kinds of things from pantyhose to cosmetics, and uh, the money was just, was just pouring in. Then he made connections with the Russian mafia to secure his business. You had what was called your son. that was the man that did the business, and then you had what was called your creche, which was your roof. And the roof was the person that protected your business and made sure that, that you'd get paid. They were the real mafia at that point. Throughout the time we did business there, about 20% of your expense was, was security, was, was as your business grew, the more guys you had to hire, almost this army, this personal army, to make sure that uh, the people respected you. He expanded his businesses to restaurants and nightclubs, I had clubs, I had strip clubs, we did big raves, big concerts. So you know, to you get yourself up for the night, I usually have an ecstasy right around 7 o'clock. And then by 8, 9 o'clock we were doing coke until 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning. And then you'd have another joint in the morning just to calm down. And you do that over and over and again, you know, day after day. David felt invincible. He had the money, women, and power. But his family back in America never gave up on him. My parents had always been praying for me, their friends had been praying for me. Then David's life began to fall apart. It started at a rave party. I had had the barman put some ecstasy in the punch bowl, and we would invited the heads of mafia from all over Russia. And one of the wives of uh, one of the top guys uh, had an allergic reaction to the punch, and they had to rush to the emergency ward. Afterward, the mafia families turned against him. They took over his businesses, and one day, he lost everything. They spared his life, but still, he had to answer to the mob boss. They made me an offer I couldn't refuse and said I had to leave St. Petersburg, basically in exile. When I got to Moscow, I was as depressed as I've ever been. I was drinking, I was on drugs. While he was in exile, his father visited. And he put his arms around me and say, David, never forget that God has an incredible purpose for your life. And he could tell that I was really down. And before he left, he'd, he'd have a Bible with him. And I said, Dad, could you leave me your Bible? As David read the Bible, he realized that God still loved him. For the first time in my life, uh, I was broken. I got to Romans, uh, where it says, you know, nothing can separate us from the love of God. You know, angels or demons, life or death. And I just said, God, please, just love me. And for the first time in my life, I felt the presence of Jesus. And I felt this overwhelming love uh, flow over me. David eventually moved back to America. He says that in God, he's found the love and acceptance he was looking for. Once that desire for the women was gone, the desire for the money was gone. Also with the alcohol and the drugs. You know, so, so once that primary addiction is gone, um, the, other, the other addictions tend to lose their power. What I really realized was that it was that little 12-year-old boy that needed to be loved and needed to know that he was all right. And when I realized you know, how much God loved that little boy and that God had brought that little boy um, to where I was at that point uh, and felt God's love. That was the healing process. That was the, that was the, that was the moment uh, that I was free.